Hi, welcome to Constitutional Chats, hosted by me, Janine Turner, and Kathy Gillespie, with students, Dakari Chapman, and me, Tova Kaplan. Join us as we discuss hot topic issues with constitutional experts. It's sponsored by Constituting America. Welcome to Constitutional Chats. We are so excited that you're with us today. Today, we're wrapping up our series on Anti-Federalist Papers, where we are comparing an Anti-Federalist Paper to a Federalist Paper. And we are so happy to have with us our very special guest, Professor Gordon Lloyd, a professor at the Pepperdine School of Public Policy. And I'll be introducing Professor Lloyd a little bit later, but we just want to recognize and thank Professor Lloyd, as he's the one who helped us structure this 13-part series. And if you missed any of them, just go on constitutingamerica.org and scroll down under constitutional chats and you'll see a little button that says archive and click on that and you can watch all of our past anti-federalist series. Now we want to start by introducing our media director, Aubrey Jackman, and Aubrey's going to put up a little poll so that we can tell who's in the audience today. Now, while y'all are answering that poll and telling us if you're a student, a teacher, a parent, a grandparent with children, donor, press, family, or friend, I want to tell you a little bit more about Aubrey. Aubrey is our media director and responsible for all this fabulous technology. Aubrey's also this year's We the Future Best College STEM winner. Aubrey's born and raised in Utah in the middle of seven children. She's a, currently a student at Brigham Young University and aspires to be an athletic coach. Aubrey, would you like to say hello? Yes, hello. So glad to be here today. Um, I'll just share the poll results pretty quick. I think, yeah, enough people have answered it. Thank you, everyone who answered that survey. So the largest group that we have with us today are we have 28% friends, and then we have 22% parents and grandparents with children, and then 16% fans. Then we have another 16% donors, 13% middle and high school students, and 6% family. So thank you all for being here today. Well, great. Thank you, Aubrey. Now I'd like to introduce our founder and co-president, the actress Janine Turner. Janine is famous for her role as Maggie O'Connell in television's Northern Exposure. As I said, she is the founder and co-president of Constituting America, which launched in 2010. And Janine continues to act, but she's also actively teaching kids about the US Constitution, having given over 540 speeches to classrooms across the country. And I'd love to put a little plug in for Janine's latest acting project where she stars in the Hallmark Channel movie, Taking the Reins. And if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to go on your cable channel and look it up, Taking the Reins. There's lots of different ways to watch it and you will love it. And Janine does a beautiful job uh, and is already getting rave reviews for her performance. And we're just uh, so proud of her. And Janine, thank you for your leadership and hard work that you put into making Constituting America run every day. We just thank you. You want to yeah, well, yes, of course. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Kathy. We're going to have a very great show today because my favorite person, Professor Gordon Loy, is with us. So, <laughs> hey, hey, it's going to be great. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, we also have on our panel, Toba Kaplan. Toba is a 17-year-old student from Chicago, Illinois, and she is a three-time winner of the We the Future contest. Toba is also our national youth director and runs a youth advisory board like a CEO. She um, really has a knack for getting all the members of our youth advisory board very involved and contributing in many different ways to Constituting America. Toba is passionate about inspiring young people to know and use their constitutional rights. Tova, would you like to say hello? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here. Like, I can't believe it's been over a year and a half and that we're closing up our Federalist series. Um, it's been amazing and I've learned so much and I'm actually on my Federalist unit in high school. So I'd say I'm pretty prepared. <laughs> you could be teaching it, I think. 
We also want to introduce Jewel and Jorn Gilbert, our other panelists. Uh, Jewel is executive director and uh, producer and Jorn Gilbert is operations director of Sing for America, a family-based company that the brothers co-founded. Sing for America seeks to show the art of truth and light through live performance. Both are proud We the Future contest winners. Sing for America is an actor-run theater company which specializes in semi-professional musicals, private training in the arts, school drama solutions, and public entertainment events, all the while revealing a colorblind world on stage. Jewel and Jorn are graduates of Moravian College, where they each earned a BA in musical performance and dramatic production. Jewel and Jorn, would y'all like to say hello? Hey, everybody. Happy to be back on this finale here with Professor Gordon Lloyd. It's been a great 13 weeks. Well, thank you. And before I introduce Professor Lloyd, I want to recognize our sponsor for today. Our sponsor for today is Mrs. Lori Forrest of Keller, Texas. And Lori is a longtime supporter of Constituting America. She, I think Lori even attended our 2013 uh, movie that we show that we had shown in Highland Park Village Theater. So Lori goes back a long way with us. And Lori, we just appreciate all you do. Lori is also a member of the Sport Clips uh, franchise family. And we recognize Sport Clips, I guess, uh, as one of our Constitution Day uh, sponsors on our Constitution Day program. So Lori, we just, we thank you and your husband, Bobby, for sponsoring our segment today. So now it is my very special honor to introduce Professor Lord and Gore. Gordon Lloyd of the Pepperdine School of Public Policy. And, you know, Janine and I recently watched a YouTube, which we encourage everyone to Google and, and look at, of Professor Lloyd delivering the Constitution Day speech at the Ronald Reagan Library. And when Professor Lloyd was being introduced at the Ronald Reagan Library, the chief learning officer of the library introduced Professor Lloyd as he, I think he said something to the effect of Professor Lloyd knows more about our country's founding than any other person except for maybe the ones that were actually there at the founding. And I think that does sum up Professor Lloyd's knowledge. Uh, Professor Lloyd is just brilliant, uh, a brilliant constitutional scholar. He is the Robert and Catherine Doxson Professor of Public Policy at Pepperdine University. He's the co-author of three books on the American founding and sole author of a book on the political economy of the New Deal. And he's the creator, with the help of our friends at the Ashbrook Center, of four highly regarded websites on the origin of the Constitution. Professor Lloyd earned his Bachelor of Arts degree in Economics and Political Science at McGill University. He completed all the coursework toward a doctorate in economics at the University of Chicago before receiving his Master of Arts and PhD degrees in government at Claremont Graduate School. Professor Lloyd is a frequent contributor to Constituting America's 90-day study series and we are grateful to him for helping us structure this important study on the Anti-Federalist Paper. Professor Lloyd helped us break the Anti-Federalist Papers down into 13 episodes, where each week we compared an Anti-Federalist Paper and a Federalist Paper. And he is going to tell you more about that now and address today's topic, which is a wrap-up of our series. So Professor Lloyd, welcome to Constituting America's Constitutional Chats. Thank you very much. I'm good to be back. In a certain sense, very happy that the program, the 13 part program has gone as well as it has. And I'm very sad that it's coming to an end, but, uh, but it shall continue as long, as long as the conversation has been planted, then the conversation will continue because people will nurture it. And uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to, to help you plant the seed and uh, help, help you uh, uh, grow the plants. Well, thank you. And, <laughs> would you like to start with maybe three to five minutes of wrap up comments on the series? Uh, Just sort of some. Well, I will definitely try to keep it to three to five minutes. Part of my problem with this stuff is I get too excited about it and therefore I, I go on. But if I have to, if I um, have to sort of wrap it up, um, I keep it open-ended at the same time evergreen. It would be, uh, why bother with this conversation at all? 
and it, it's because the brothers have asked me that question um, in a very sometimes subtle way uh, uh, in terms of it's the, the relevance of the original conversation for today's life. I think that's an extremely important question, although I think um, the current generation, not the brothers, the current generation placed too much emphasis on what's in it for me. And I think if you ask that question, you won't fully understand what the original debate was about. The original debate is what's in it for us. And it's not I, I the individual I, um, endorse this constitution, but it's we the people. So it's a conversation. It's not just a conversation with oneself to express oneself. It's a conversation with others because we live together in a country, it's civic. So civic means uh, the community. And it doesn't mean to say that you um, give up your individuality. It simply means that you are a member of, of a group, whether the group is at the local level or it's a club. Americans are well known as Alexis Tocqueville noted when he came here in the early 19th century. Americans are joiners, even despite the fact that Americans are individualists, they're also joiners. They, they join all kinds of clubs from Elks to sororities to Little League. So they're joiners as well as individuals. And I think that needs to be kept alive because as I, I have chats with myself, but you, know, you ought not to have too many chats otherwise you go crackers. You have to have chats with others because you live in a community. So I think that's one point I'd like to make. The idea of a conversation, a dialogue must continue instead of looking upon it as, an, as sort of simply or merely an expression of one's personal life. Um, I'm reminded of John F. Kennedy's, ask not what uh, your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And, I, and I've said in many talks, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't extend that to the constitution to say, ask not what the constitution could do for you, but what you can do for the constitution because part of the constitution is giving you liberty. But I think trying to get people out of their own simple tribe or individuality and asking, well, what is it, what, what is good for me? Uh, what, what, what's in it for me? I'd like to just to change that, what's in it for us without losing the me. So that's one point. Um, the, uh, some of the questions that have come up and particularly from the panel, deal with um, I mean, the sustainability of that original conversation. Haven't we changed so much that, um, that th th this quest is just sort of antiquarianism, that we have nothing better to do, so therefore we do it and we pass it on. No, I think that one of the things that I, that I hope that we've learned from this conversation is that human nature doesn't necessarily change that much. That people will fight, people will quarrel. They have factions. The question is, where does it come from? And so I think the anti-federalist um, point, which is particularly brought out by the brothers, is, is that they, they, they don't trust power and that power corrupts. That seems to be is something that is, uh, pretty constant through the ages and it's constant today. Does power corrupt? That's an interesting question. Um, and I think the answer is yes. Why? Because we have human nature that somehow loves power and we don't always use power for the best. We use power sometimes uh, uh, for the worst. So how do, we, how do we manage to use power for the best and try to avoid using power for the worst? And I think that that's part of the Federalist anti-Federalist conversation. And that's what's at stake. And uh, the, the way that you have sort of promoted and advertised and explained this uh, session is not just what was at stake for them in the first session, but what is at stake today, not just because what's in it for me, but has the conversation fundamentally changed from the founding? Or is there a certain continuity to the conversation? And I think the answer is, there's a certain continuity because of human nature. 
And then you have to ask, well, what is it that's good in human nature and how do we get it? What's somehow terrible in human nature and how do we avoid it? And I think the whole conversation on the separation of powers has to do with um, the use and misuse of power and how you separate power. And so the separation of powers, the, the emphasis should not, be, should not just simply be on separation, but the word power. And so that you're separating it somehow to, to restrain the bad uses of power while while still letting through, and this is the mystery, how do you stop the bad without, but, but not the good? And that becomes a huge mystery. And the anti-federalist contribution there is you can't. You just can't. Right, let me go back to the first point and then I'll shut up. It's, it's that it, this, this notion of, um, of community, of individuality. I'm trying to join the two together rather than as opposites. Too often they've been looked upon as, as opposites. But the whole notion of federalism, I mean, we just did the separation of powers, which is point number two. The federalism is really point number one, which is, is it possible to have variety from one community to another and still live together? Because that's what federalism means. It means that we in California can have uh, um, recalls, uh, even though they we can have recalls, but other states don't. Can we live with that? And if we go back to the past, certain states had slavery and other states did not. Can we live with that? Certain states, if we bring it up into the 20th century, certain states permitted abortion on demand. Other states didn't permit abortion at all. Can we live with that variety? How much variety can we live with? We, Thomas Jefferson helps, helps me put it this way. And it, he, asked, he was asked about religion. And he says, what do I care whether my neighbor believes in one God or a hundred gods, as long as he doesn't pick my pocket or break my leg? All right, so I try to use that and say, well, what do I care if my, if my neighbor owns one slave or a hundred slaves, as long as he didn't pick my pocket or break my leg? Well, it does bother me. So how much, how much of that, what my neighbor does bothers me and how much of what my neighbor does doesn't bother me so that I can let that person live in freedom. We can be different. That, that's how you get diversity. But, but how much diversity can we put up with? I think that is the federalism question. And that, that I think is what is one big part of the federalist anti-federalist debate. How much, what is federalism and how much can we put up with? And the second part is the separation of powers and does power corrupt in human nature? That's how I would sort of summarize what is at stake. Uh, given all the 12 lessons, that 12 sections that we've been through, those two keep popping out at me. Community, nature. All right, so, uh, our, well, I have so much running through my brain. Um, and I watched your fabulous performance at the Reagan Library where you were the sole guest and it was like an hour and a half, I think, hour and 47 minutes. Yeah. And you were wonderful. And um, as always, and but it was interesting to me, a few points I want to toss out and, and get your response to. And it was interesting to me, one young woman, uh, she might have been a student, maybe 20, mm -hmm. 20 years old or so. She said, should we modernize the Constitution? And um, it, that's an interesting question, I, I think, in that, and then your response was, well, human nature is still human nature. You know, th there's tyranny and power. People still want power. And, and in that respect, the Constitution is timeless, which, um, and so uh, whenever anybody asks a question like that, I always ask, well, which part do you want to modernize? You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? T tell me which part you'd like to modernize. Because really what it's doing in the constitution now is it's preventing tyranny. It's these checks and balances that have become so incredibly vital. Um, and if we want to modernize it, we can do an amendment. Um, and I think that's really pivotal for, for people to understand. It's like, I remember I did a radio interview and many of on this panel have heard this story, but it was in the beginning of uh, constituting America, probably in 2010. And I said, well, I, I've launched a foundation about the United States constitution. And he said, oh, the constitution, I don't like it. 
<laughs> so, so I said, oh, all right, um, which part? Which part do you, do you not like? And he really couldn't tell me anything. But of course, if he had told me something, that's what the amendment process is for. But I, I think the bigger point is how you talk about power corrupts. And in my opinion, the constitution is still modern um, because it prevents the ugly head of tyranny and of, 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 where power could corrupt. Um, but the question I have for you is to elaborate a little bit more on, on this aspect that you, a big, a wonderful point you made. Um, and I think it applies to our conclusion of our study of the federalist and anti-federalist, which is deliberation. Mm -hmm. You talked at length about this. And I think that's what we've studied the past 13 weeks is deliberation, the, how the anti-federalists and the federalists deliberated. And they were there in the convention together and they wrote their articles afterwards and they were there in the ratifying conventions together. And that it, we have forgotten how to deliberate. Now we just want to win. Um, and, and it's my idea and I wanna win. And so we, we don't deliberate. And if we don't deliberate, then we don't compromise. And so that's the first thing I'd like to talk about, um, which, which is the, the lack of our, our country. I think the rising generations like Jewel and Jordan Tova will be much better than Aubrey will be much better at this, but the, 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 the art of deliberating um, to not just win. And that's what the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists had to do um, mm -hmm. and how James Madison had to give. And, and then, um, so, so that's what I would like to talk about a little bit more is, is deliberation. And there's something else on the tip of my brain here that I wanted to, to mention, um, which will come to me the minute I toss it over to you. It was about deliberation. Oh, 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 lastly, it seems to me the danger we face as a country today is the aspect of social. We become, we vote based on our social feelings. And we seem to have forgotten all about the running of a government, the debt, the trillion dollars of debt, the overreach of unelected czars, the, the things that are really endangering our country, um, we don't seem to be very concerned about anymore. And I'm worried about that. Okay, I'm tossing it over now. Well, deliberation, what, what I've learned and I learned from the founding is deliberation just doesn't happen. It's more likely that people will hold to their own position and not be persuaded. So the deliberative process has to be encouraged and supported. And so one of the first things they, the framers did at the Constitutional Convention was to lay down some rules. Uh, it's extremely tempting to, to, to bypass those first two, three days at the convention as boring. And let's get to the real action, which is Madison introducing the Virginia plan. And this is how I'd like the Constitution to look like. So we tend to overlook the because it's boring, it's just rules, regulations. I shall speak first, you shan't speak. But those rules and regulations are extremely important for setting up the tone, the nature of the conversation. Um, so for example, if one of the, if one of the delegates wishes to uh, really change the conversation in a massive, they, they, raise the, they raise their hand and introduce a motion. And then the parliament, it, and it's very, very interesting. Why didn't they just simply adopt the parliamentary rules of Britain? There's a long tradition of parliamentary behavior with rules and procedures. And I have to go back just a little bit before the convention, because now I'm doing work for the first time seriously, I mean, serious work on the creation of the Declaration of Independence and the, at, at the, the role of the first and second Continental Congress. And uh, what are the first things they do, the first Continental Congress does is by what rules shall we deliberate? By what rules shall we follow? And one delegate says, well, we've got all the parliamentary rules where I have a British tradition. And they, it's just, it, what comes out is, but the British tradition that can, is not really conducive to the kind of deliberation we want. The British tradition is not deliberation linked to consent. It's more deliberation linked to obedience. And, and so how can you generate 
deliberation model which people can buy into and they, that, that they help create. So one of the first things for deliberation is setting down the rules. And so well, why don't we just follow the rules that were given us? Because that leads to monarchy or limited monarchy. It doesn't lead to the kind of republicanism that we want. So we need different kinds of rules. And I think that is one of the first things to, to, um, to, you know, to, to indicate. Deliberation just doesn't happen. You have to encourage it. <clears throat> and linked to that was um, a rule is you don't speak to your neighbor, your, your neighboring delegate, while somebody, is, while somebody else is speaking. That's rude. And we're not just talking about rude behavior in terms of, oh, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that, that's, not, that's naughty. It's rude behavior because it gives, it gives more than the impression. That you really don't care what that person is saying. You'd rather talk to your neighbor about some business about farming or dating or something else, rather than pay attention. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's the same thing, turn off your cell phone. Because what you should be doing is, is your, your attention, your energy should be on what the person is saying, even if you don't agree with what the person can say. You say, you can, you can jot down, I don't agree with what this person is saying and have your own notes. But you don't deliberately undermine the process of that person speaking because the other side of speaking is hearing. And it's all, all well and good today to hear, I want my voice at the table. Well, fine, we can all arrange for your voice to be, your voice to be stated, but that doesn't mean you say your voice is going to be heard. And it, it doesn't even mean that your voice is going to be persuasive. So that deliberation involves persuasion and persuasion, you're going to get some edgy stuff coming up because it, it's, it's well known in the, in, the, in the fundraising world that scaring somebody, you're more likely to get funds than by not scaring people. And I think that's, um, that's tough. And you see some of that in the deliberative process of the convention, but it's, but it's, but it's stopped. But somebody's saying, listen, we're here not to scare each other. We're here to solve this difficulty. So I would just, I would just mention a few things like that, which I think from that time and from now, you can't, it's, it's one thing to bring your voice to the table, but it's another thing to encourage people to listen and learn and, you, and, then, and, and consent to listening and consent to learning rather than having to say, well, we're in a room and we all agree. So it becomes groupthink. And that's what I, one of the things I was trying to get across at the Reagan Library is that how do you produce teamwork without producing groupthink? So that you, you wanna have a team, like you have a team, you, you, all of you are a team, but you don't, which means that you, that you speak first and then you speak and then some others speak and you try to keep to the three to five minutes and whatnot. And then you have somebody like me on who just mouths off and breaks all those kind of rules. And then you have to sort of scramble to get the rules back in order because you know that if you're gonna participate, you need to be heard, not just your voice being stated. So I think that's part of the deliberative process and I, a very useful way, it, it's, um, it's a way that maybe contemporary people don't feel inclined to follow. But I think it's a, a very useful way is to see, is the deliberative process linked to something called republicanism. That is, if monarchy really doesn't require deliberation, it requires God save the king or God save the queen. And feudalism doesn't require deliberation. It requires, yes, my lord, yes, my lady. It doesn't, it, so it comes up, how do you, uh, how do you agree to be ruled? That, that is critical because aristocracy, feudalism, communism, there's no consent involved. And uh, so how, how do you combine deliberation and consent, which requires respect? So how do you respect each other? But you're not going to be the same. So how do you build, how do you build this idea of respect? And I, um, I think we've lost part of that. 
I think we're very interested in bringing our voice to the table, but I think we haven't built the, the notion that somehow there's more to it than that. There's consent. Okay. And what do yeah. you do when you lose? Yeah. What do you do when you lose? True. What do so you, you, true. Throw, you throw a bomb, do you leave the country? Or do you say, I'll come back in two years time. So part of the deliberative process is you'll have another chance. And that, that's why the constitution is still so modern and still so wonderful. Um, but I need to, I need to cut, uh, I can just sit here and listen to you talk all day, but I need Tova and Jewel and Jordan and Kathy to have their moment. So uh, Tova, if you'll take it to two, 240 and then uh, Jewel and Jordan, y'all take it to 250, okay? And so, um, so, every, so the, everyone has their next chunk of time here. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, so I was wondering how did the founders balance the rights of the individual with the needs of the community? And do you think in American society, we're leaning too, more, too much one way or another? I think the way the balance happens is that it's somehow it's produced by this deliberative process. That if we talk things, there's a, a certain faith that if we talk things through and we listen and we ponder and we realize that, that we can't get all that we want, but doing the best that we can, then through that, through that mechanism that you can move from simply an individual choice to some kind of collective choice. So that it's not that, oh, there's a, there's a, there's a wisdom or a truth um, there and we just sort of impose it. It's part of the whole process that we discover it and what things that we can live with. I'll I, I, I give you one example. It's that Madison came in to the convention with a plan which did not include uh, 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 much of a role for the states at all because he thought the states were the problem. So therefore we have to strengthen the union, make a, uh, to create a more perfect union. And that Roger Sherman consistently said, but people are used to living in communities which are protected by states so that states can be different. And so the constitution as it finally comes out has a role for the states to play in it, yet su sufficiently that Sherman can sign on and yet not so big that Madison can't sign on. So, that the so that's how you balance the two. That is, you have to realize that you cannot have your own way all the time, or you cannot have perfection. This is not a perfect world with perfect people. And that living with less than perfection isn't that bad. It's, and that's tough for a lot of young people today to, to, to come to grips with. If I don't have it 100%, I mean, it's not just young people. It, it's like no child left behind. But one, what, what if you was just one child left behind? Wouldn't that be better than 1,000 children left behind? We have, but why is it that we have to search for utopia? It doesn't say to create a perfect union. It says to create a more perfect union. So the way in which you balance the two is by realizing I'm important, but I'm a part of a larger group and that negotiation is, is important to, to, for me to be able, able to live in a community. Oh, I, you know, I could just go off and live on, live on a rock or an island and be by myself. I wouldn't have to deal with the community at all. Well, great, thank you. Um, and then another question I had was, you know, we've talked a lot about how the Anti-Federalists were obviously very opposed to the Constitution and had pretty consistent opposition. But we talk about, well, the Constitution was passed, and then we kind of lose them in the thread of the story. So what happened to the Anti-Federalists after the Constitution was passed? Did they just, you know, over time, did they realize that the Constitution, you know, did they come to appreciate it? Or did they continue to be against it? Or did they put their opposition onto another issue? Kind of what happened to them? That's, that's very good question and, and it's very difficult to answer in the time in the, the limited time we have but here's um here's one answer elbridge jerry didn't sign the constitution 
but he became James Madison's vice president. So he joined the system. So I think part of what the Anti-Federalists did is they became part of the system and they kept alive the idea of localism, uh, warning of the dangers of power. They kept that alive within the system itself rather than try to create an outside system. Uh, I, I, some people have claimed that the anti-federalists became the secessionists and, uh, and, and therefore gave credence and arguments to the South leaving the Union. And I don't think that's how, I, the anti-federalists weren't secessionists. They were restrainists, not if I don't get my way, I'm gonna leave. And part of the reason why they didn't leave and they joined is because part of what the Anti-Federalists liked were, was in, were incorporated in the Constitution. For example, each state shall be equally represented in the Senate. I mean, that's an Anti-Federalist position. So that you're not arguing that each individual, that becomes in the House. But so that the, so that the um, Anti-Federalist position gets incorporated within the Constitution itself, all the easier then to buy in to the Constitution and just become, um, shall we say, warners of what might happen. Um, be careful, rather than, oh, I didn't get my way, therefore I'm secessionist. <clears throat> so I think the anti-federalist uh, position uh, remains alive in the sense of a warning. Uh, beware of the corruptibility of power. Is that it, Tova? Okay, all right. Go, are, we, are, we good? are we playing by the rules, Janine? What's that? Are we playing by the rules and getting this? Yes, done? playing by the rules. It's a going really well. I was in speaker view and I, I couldn't see Tova's face, so I had to quickly uh, I, go to I, bench. Are, okay, right, Julian, Julian Jordan, you're on. <laughs> all right, I got, I got one big, Big question for you. So we've been talking about these anti-federalists, and I think that what I've learned is that the anti-federalist papers are an expression, really, that the founders collectively did foresee the issues that we'd be going through today, because it is about human nature. And understanding that, where we are, what could reel this federal beast in that's been created? I know that the founders' view is that it was the people. It was education, it was virtue. But practically today, with giant unelected government organizations and with an enormous amount of wealth moved through corporations that are oftentimes international, but helped by the government, um, what is the practical thing that we could be looking for that would um, put some more power back into, I guess, the states? or reel the federal beast back into a more strict understanding of constitutionality? Well, that's, again, that's a very good question and very difficult, very, very difficult to answer because I think one of the things that's happened, you and I particularly have talked about this, the role of the progressives in the 1880s, 1890s, the, the vestiges of anti-federalism which, was, which I was just answering a couple of minutes ago. You can see in terms of restrainings and warnings. One of the things that the progressives wanted was nationalism. And the emphasis is not on being a Virginian, it's being on an American. And, and, um, and so Teddy Roosevelt wrote a piece called The New Nationalism. And so all these new deals, these new things, these such as are, are sort of creations where we become one nation and we get rid of these local differences. So it's going to become extremely difficult to reverse that. I don't know whether we can reverse that. I think or it becomes this position of, I told you so, or um, <clears throat> be careful to go one step further. It's almost, it's almost like, I know that I cannot reverse the power to the states or to the lo localities, but, but again, I just have to keep crying the warning. <clears throat> now, to get political for a moment, it, uh, it's still alive 
anti-federalism is still alive more in the left today than it is in the right. The left wing, for example, for example, under Trump, the left the left decided that it was the right of a state to to uh, not go along with the federal authorities on re reporting illegal immigrants. California in particular took the role as if California was a nation. So that, that this idea of um, we are a nation, but we are a state is still there, but we but the, the march is more and more and more towards nation. And, that, and, and, and part of the um, EOS webcam utility, what does that mean? We're, we're here. The, the camera's just restarting itself. All right. So I could keep talking to you? Yep. Yeah, keep going. All right, oh, okay, there you are. Um, part of becoming an old man is that you, for, you forget where you were um, at one moment. I think it's extremely difficult to reverse. I think there are spots where it can be reversed. It can be warnings. Why, for example, just as an example, um, why should education policy be taken away from the local um, authorities. We now have, only within the last 40 years or so, do we have an actual US Department of Education. That was under Jimmy Carter that came in. So it's, it, it's say 40, 50 years that that US has been involved in education up till, up till the 1970s it was clearly understood that education was a state and local matter. It still is in some ways. Curriculum is still written by local school boards and local stuff, except, except see, if the, if the school is, is, is in a local district and, and that encourages segregation, racial segregation, such that, then the feds get involved. The feds, the feds get involved more and more because more and more difficult for uh, to, to reverse the policy. Do you think there is any way, do you think that there is any way uh, with within the system now to curb the revenue of the federal government by the states? It doesn't appear so. I mean, this, uh, it doesn't appear so. They, they, both parties seem very happy with spending. And both parties don't seem to have a problem with the balanced budget, balanced budget, or with with the size of the debt at the moment. I don't see candidates running on that. Are getting, I, 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 the answer is that, no. I don't think so. Um, right, Jordan, you're up. I think. Uh, so this is honestly a similar question that you might answer real quick, and then I'll ask you a follow up. Um, <laughs> since the ratification of the Constitution, what event or law happened or was passed that you would go back and change in order to keep our nation closer to the ideals of the founding fathers? Um, well, one, is it, it, since the ideas of the founding fathers, what they agreed upon is that there would be a republic. And, a, and, and those days didn't matter whether you're in America or in Europe, for example, the choice was by being between being a republic or being a monarchy. That's the 1770s, 1780s, 1790s in France. Before then it was, shall we have an absolute monarchy or a limited monarchy? The idea that we would have republicanism, whatever republicanism is, and there'll be disagreements between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists on that question, uh, it's gonna be a republic. Well, Ben Franklin's question when asked, so what have you created? He says, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. And I'm wondering whether we've kept it, which is your, which, which, which is your point. So if, what, would I, what, I go, what would I go back and do? One, I would really uh, try to stop presidents taking so lightly the idea that they're commander in chief of everything and can issue executive orders all over the place. That's what monarchs did and did without any resistance. And I think both the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists would resist the idea of an executive. I mean, they wouldn't resist an executive going to war, but they would have to have the support of the Congress constitutionally in order to go to war. Now, it seems to me that politics has become war 
an executive, chief executives issue executive orders all over the place to get policy done. And um, that is one thing I think needs to be done to get it back to the founders. That is, you can have a strong presidency, but you don't, don't but the strong presidency is limited by the constitution. The constitution is not just what the president says it is. And similarly, I would say that you need judicial restraint. And that judicial restraint means the constitution is not whatever the judges say it is. But that requires civic education in the people themselves to want the constitution. And I think in addition to those two points, restrain the executive and restrain the judiciary, I would say, em empower the people more so that the people care more about what it means. You cannot have a republic, as your brother has said, you cannot have a republic unless the people in some sense are virtuous. By virtuous, it doesn't mean that they don't commit sin. It means that they care. Uh, they, they, they have a spirit of wanting their country to do well or their locality to do well or their team to do well. And they turn out, you can see it in, in sports. They turn out and they support the team. That I think is what we need to do. And um, I, I, one of the one things, the education, it seems to me that there is a, a, a certain suspicion that by going back to the founding and retrieving the founding, we are doing something irrelevant or are doing something immoral or we're doing something useless, that we have to live in the present. And I would think that my last point to you is that, that um, yeah. we need to go back, not to stay back. We need to go back in order to come back. We live in the present, but not everything we do in the present is correct or, um, or, 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 or sensible. Sometimes sensible things have been said and done by people in the past. Mm. Therefore we read, therefore, we, right? We read. I, I give you what you want. Your sister, your questions are so good. I mean, look, the Federalist Papers, the Anti-Federalist Papers, right? Where did they appear? They appeared in newspapers. Where were they read? In taverns and in pubs. The newspapers almost disappeared today. The, so that the, the deliberative at it, I mean, for example, one might, uh, I mean, if this was really, if our show here today was put on the modern technology, the, 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 the viewer would be asked, like or don't like? And somehow you balance up the likes, you balance up the non-likes and you have an answer. That's not deliberation. So I think finally, to restore the deliberative process, we need to restore some education, that education is not simply, you, one of the things that happened in, in, in this pandemic in California is that, is that school children learned, uh, uh, forgot how to read and write. They forgot how to add and subtract and multiply and divide. They forgot the basics. You so you have a, a two years of, of, of children growing up, knowing, not knowing the basics. Okay, um, Kathy, I need to toss it to you. And, and I'll just say, your, your, the example that you just made about surveys is so true. And that's why I don't like them. Because how often am I asked, was your experience good or bad? And that's, and I'm like, uh, well, it was good, but, <laughs> you know, um, and it was bad, but, but, but it, 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 yeah. you can't yeah. give a real good answer. Janine, hmm? you, you can't have a butt. Well, not in today's no, society, no but if you I mean, were that's to because, deliberate, you would be able to. And you have to open up and say why. You have to explain. You have to have yeah. a debate, deliberation. But they don't want deliberation. They want, right. they, they, they want crunch. They want numbers and crunching. Everybody Everybody just wants to know, was it good or was it bad? And, and it just doesn't exist that way. And I'm also very worried about where people are going to be getting their news because less and less do people, do the rising generations have 
cable that they don't they don't read the newspaper i don't even know like i, I don't even know where they get the news anymore okay kathy go ahead well, we have got some great comments and questions, and I thought I'd start by reading a few of the comments. Susan Baker says, love Professor Lloyd's insights. Thank you. Sandy Thatcher says, as a scholarly publisher for 50 years, I couldn't agree more about the need to read. I have 4,000 books in my library. Oh, good for you. And then um, we also have Mrs. Portis, who says, excellent speech, very informative. Thank you very much, Professor Lloyd. And then she asks a question, which I thought would be a great prompt for you to tell your story about the handshake with Melanchthon Smith that you told in the Reagan Library uh, Constitution Day speech. Mrs. Porter asked for some ways to demonstrate respect to each other from both sides of the issues. Do you want to share with us this yeah what what she's talking about is the handshake after sporting events that we go and shake hands and we just don't have that sense of uh sport you know sportsmanship in the political world anymore that's what she's referring to professor Boyd Lloyd. well and also i think Lockton smith the anti-federalist yeah. actually shook the hands of the federalists yeah. at the, the, the new york the new york ratifying convention was particularly divisive because the two because at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, there were three New York delegates, Yates, Lansing, and Hamilton. And Yates and Lansing would outvote Hamilton. Hamilton left because he didn't see what good he could do. And Yates and Lansing left because they didn't like what they were seeing. So they went back to fight. So the three of them are present in the New York ratifying convention. So you've got a fight being on your hands. And it was nasty. The anti-federalists went in. The, the anti-federalists were two parts of it. Those who were willing to compromise and those who were not. Those who were willing to compromise got some of their way in the Constitution itself, Roger Sherman. Those who were not left, didn't sign, and set up a war of, to, to defeat. So one of the strategies of Hamilton and Madison was to uh, form, a, form an alliance with the reasonable anti-federalists who wanted to restrain things rather than throw everything out so that you could isolate the um, th those who wanted to throw everything out. I mean, Langton Smith emerged as one of those, what is now often known as a, a, a deal maker or somebody across the island you could talk with. And Hamilton and Smith talked and um, <clears throat> the, the, what we would call the extreme anti-federalists. Well, often anti-federalists have been looked upon as extremists. And that's why I'm glad I, in, in one of the previous questions, said that I don't see the anti-federalists as precursors of the secessionist movement in the South. I see them much more as a precursor of warning. And I told you so, and be careful. And, and watch out. I mean, they're, war they're warners like that. And be careful of power. To the extent that they have any influence, it is like bringing term limits, bringing such and such. Uh, so that Melanchthon Smith, um, right near the end, uh, was faced, because he was the leader of the anti federalist in, in, in New York, he was faced with this rabid crowd who said, um, we, let's have ratification on condition. And the condition was that in the first year of Congress, uh, there would be structural amendments as well as Bill of Rights, and that we should ratify on condition. And uh, Hamilton and right, in conjunction no conditions. We ratify, but we, it's not conditional we will leave to the next group of people the way in which it shall be implemented, but no conditions. See, if you put conditions on an agreement, you are in fact um, limiting. You're not really making an agreement worthwhile. You're conditioned. So how do you make a conditional handshake? You don't. The handshake is I've accepted the outcome. That doesn't mean to say that I won't fight you again in, 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 in a month. Uh, sports thing. I still think in hockey, for example, one of, the, one of the toughest sports, 
uh, they, at the end, um, they'd shake their hands. And, and, and I remember as a kid, sports in school, one was the thing, what was the point in having sports at school? It was to, 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 to create um, dis discipline, the idea of winning, good, but gentlemanliness or womanliness. And that doesn't mean to say be, be a fighter or whatnot. It means I gave it my best shot but now move on. And you know what? I congratulate you on your performance. And the winners say, I congratulate you on what you have done. And so Adam, uh, Melanchthon Smith and, and Alexander Hamilton both agreed that it would be not conditional, but they both agreed that in the first Congress, something would be addressed with regard to the question of, of, of powers, which the anti-federalists were concerned about. So the, secessionist anti-federalists got pushed to the sidelines. The warning anti-federalists joined the government. And Melanchthon Smith as Brutus were giving warnings. Never once in all those readings of Brutus said, you do this or else. It's much more of, if you do this, then this is going to occur. So be careful. So that's the handshake. We are uh, not enemies. We are doing our best for our team. But you know what? That was a game well played, played by the rules. And there were referees or linesmen and their job is, to, and now of course we have to have video reviews. Of, of very, why? Because we can't trust the linesmen. We can't trust the umpire anymore. Why? Because they might make the wrong decision. Well, sorry folks. If that's, the, if that's the kind of society we want where no one makes a mistake, we're in for a lot of trouble because why have deliberation? Just have a video and, it, and the robot will make the decision for you. Deliberations don't necessarily end that where you win, but it's tough. It's tough to teach the young that. And I am so pleased by the way that, um, of the, to hear the number of, um, um, older people, parents, grandparents, concerned citizens watching this show. I think that's incredibly important. And uh, the group that I really want to get uh, involved is not, it's not just youth. I'm involved with the youth, but I, but I teach and I work with Ashbrook and you work with Pepperdine. Youth, I don't mean 13, 15 year olds, I mean early 20s. But I'm, well, I think the real, where the real solution can be is in the parents who have finally come to realize because they have children or because they, they were doing too many things at one time, but now they, they, now they have the time and the interest and the concern that they start re reading about the constitution. They wanna learn and they then have become amazed that their children are not learning it in, 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 uh, or their grandchildren are not learning. So I think that cohort of, of, of elderly parents, I don't mean by that, I'm trying to find a word that, is, and I can't find it. It's just concerned parents and concerned grandparents who may not have been as concerned before are now concerned. And they're asking the question, what do we do about it? And, and that's I, so true. That, that reminds me of 2010, when we started Constituting America, we started with a contest for kids. But soon Janine came, Janine said, you know, we have so many parents coming to us saying, I want to teach my kids about the constitution, but I don't have the resources. And that's how Janine had the idea to start our 90 day studies. And you're exactly right. Uh, it's so important that, that we as parents, even those of us like me, where our, our kids are a little older, it's still not uh, too late to, to teach the kids. No, I, yeah, a great point. It's not, it's, it's not and so when we ask where, where does civic education start, you don't try to create a curriculum and get it passed and 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 uh, get worried about the sixteen nineteen project and this that and the other. Uh, what's wrong with um, in the older days? You read the Bible, you read Shakespeare. There's nothing wrong in adding the Constitution to to to, to that. Reading some of these debates, and what I've done for the last 15, 20 years of my life is is to try to provide a guide without saying this is what it is. I, 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 if anything, it's, it's a conversation. And I think uh, people, as Janine has mentioned, 
we don't seem to be interested that much in conversation anymore. We seem to be interested in winning. So we have to revive the conversation. But you're not going to simply revive it at, by, through schools because the teachers themselves have been taught. Uh, uh, they're, they're under incredible restraints. They have to do so many things in such a limited period of time. They don't have and the class sizes. They don't have the time to, to, to sit down and do really original work unless it's an AP or you're very lucky to have done the Federalist Papers in Utah. I mean, to be, to be serious for a moment, when I taught sort of full-time at Pepperdine and, and was in the graduate program, teaching in the graduate school, one of the first questions in, my, in a basic course that I created for, for, for the students in pu public policy was, how many of you have read the Federalist? A class of 30 people, 10. These, these are graduate students. I and they are that. at a time when they're probably not going to read the Federalist Papers unless they're in a class where it's assigned because they have to go and get a job because then they go and get married. Then they have kids. They have to take care of them. They don't have the time to do it. Who has the time to do it? Parents, grandparents, particularly grandparents, concerned citizens who have the time in order to, 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 to read this. And I'm amazed at how people don't know how to read. Very true. Well, that's well, really true. Go ahead, Kathy. Go ahead. I'm just gonna, I was just gonna toss it to you because I think, oh, you know. Just... Well, I know. I, I, because I'm the one that gets to wrap it up. <laughs> I'm the one. Wrap it up. <laughs> um, yes, okay. Well, oh my gosh, it's 3.04 Eastern time and we have to, uh, we have to wrap this up, which we could just talk about it. We could deliberate about it forever. Um, but that's everything you said. My mind is, is, is just spinning and it's so incredibly true. I was going to joke. They can't read the Federalist Papers. We as a people, I won't blame it on any generation. We have to go binge watch. <laughs> if only we would binge watch something, you know, about the, the, we need the Constitution instead of a Binge watching is just kind of taking up everybody's brain power. And, and, and in closing, it's just so interesting to me that, that things seem to be so fast and we seem to have so much more knowledge and yet nothing gets, it's so hard to get things done. And in talk about reading, I, I read an article that, that people are losing their frontal lobes mm -hmm. because everything's just snippets. And so they can't concentrate anymore on actually reading a book. Because it's, it, and gosh, you know, even, even I, it's like, oh, did I get a text? I got a text. I got a text. I got to see my phone, my phone, my phone. The phone calls at us, which is going to be our demise, I think, because it's going to be like the computer's calling to us. And we, we, we even, I, I read a survey that even if the phone is off and then the other side of the room, you're still thinking about your phone and all the stuff we want to know. And we can't focus on reading anymore. So we've lost that ability to truly, really concentrate. I mean, not those that are in college right now, but it's, it's just, I don't know, it's going to be interesting I, with the whole computer thing is, is um, but to deliberate, right, Jewel and Jorn, you want to go out and say something in closing? It, we're running late here, but to, to deliberate and then to shake hands and to realize it's not just about winning, we're going to, we're going to show up and, and also I thought it was really interesting that the, the ones that said my way or bust lost all their influence. Uh, Jewel and Jorn, any closing remarks? Okay. Thank you for the 13 week study. And I think we had a great closing day today. The two of you, good luck in your business ventures and in your studies. And I hope you don't forget uh, uh, five minutes a day on the Federalist Papers. All right, deal. <laughs> it's better than no, no, and then no time at all. Yes, <laughs> that and an apple. Even if you just read one paragraph, you know, right. one paragraph. And I, I, you're young and you have your future ahead of you. I was talking to somebody the other day and they were uh, you know, they're in their late 60s and they're slowing down, but they don't know what to do with themselves now. They're looking forward to retirement in a sense because they, they don't really like their job. <laughs> they don't want to, but they don't know what to do in retirement. And my sort of smart aleck response was, why don't you read the Federalist Papers? <laughs> And the sort of response, well, that is something you should do when you're young. And I'm thinking, well, we're not doing it when we're young. So why not do it when you're older? When you have the time to do it. And, the and, then, 
and then teach the younger generations, which is yeah. really, really so younger important. I'll, I'll, I'll say this is important. Let's talk about it. Let's deliberate. I, look, the worst thing I would do if I if I had a, a, a grandchild, which I do, you have a grandchild coming in and say, um, I say well, let, let's talk about the let's talk about the founding. When look at me and think, what the heck is he talking about? Why am I go, why am I going to bother with that? And then and and I have then I resist and say, you know what? I'm not going to put on a little crooked hat. I'm not going to put on a costume. I'm not going to parade in front of you to get your attention. Nonsense. I'm going to sit you down, and we're going to read. And I want you to read that first sentence. And you read the first sentence. Do I have to? Right. You want to spend some time together? Let's spend some time together. Let's read the first sentence. You read the first sentence. So what does it say? I don't know. Well, let's read it again. I don't know. Well, let's read it again. You see, you don't know. Well, then you have to learn how to read. And we, we, the basics. That's what's that's what's going in in, in education. So if we were to say, answer a question from earlier, if I were to go back and say, how do you bring back the framework? It would be in terms of learning how to learning how to read and write and add and subtract. And but, philosophy, we might add, philosophy. They were they were real uh, deliberators. Okay, we have to shut down. I'm so sorry. It's three oh eight. We're supposed to stop at three, but we can all listen. Professor Gordon Lloyd, we love you, and you have to come back. It was a great 13-week study, and I hope you'll come back soon, and we're so grateful. You're just the best. Well, good good for you. Good for all of you for sticking out. I mean, because, you know, it takes some time and energy and commitment. And and you you read the material, which is important, and and. To read the original. You'll notice I didn't really pile on the original, but there was enough, I hope, enough so that you could get into the material, but not so much that you get turned off. That is the key to, to getting people into original material. Yeah, yeah. Well, we thank you so much. You're, You're just welcome. brilliant and awesome. And we yes. have to come back. I know popular demand, all of our listeners and viewers will want that. Kathy, Aubrey, Jewel Jorn, uh, Yes, and Tova, who had to go to class. And all of you for watching our fabulous study. Kathy, we have some really cool uh, modern day topics. Next week's going to be about this terrible thing situation that happened with the murder of, of um, Gabby. And we're going to talk about the Fourth and Fifth Amendment in relation to that next week. You want to elaborate a little bit about that, Kathy? Definitely. We've, uh, we'll have Cully Stimson on with the Heritage Foundation, and he's an expert on the Fourth and Fifth Amendments and former prosecutor. And he's going to be talking with us about exactly how they applied in the case and answer a lot of questions that I that many people have been asking uh, about uh, just, just how this case has played out so far. So, um, you know, we're very excited about that. And then the week after that, we're going to talk about uh, can states control their own borders and what the Constitution says about that. And I think the third uh, in this series of current topics that we're going to be doing is going to be on the debt, which Professor Lloyd, I think, mentioned earlier. Uh, maybe it was Janine, but um, we're going to explore that a little bit more, too. Yeah, because we don't pay attention to the things that like that, like we're going to be broke <laughs> okay all right great studies coming up thank you everybody you have a great all night right. thank you yeah. goodbye. bye professor gordon Lloyd. we love you goodbye. goodbye the blessings of liberty upon you all yes and you too <laughs>